Maybe. Yes. All right. So let's make sure that you can see the slides. You can. Yay. So welcome back. We're going to finish up animal phylogeny today. And I'm basically just going to go through a bunch of animals. <sighs> so strap in. And that's, it's going to be so fun. But first, let's finish what we were talking about with animal phylogeny. So remember that animals are divided into two main branches. I'm in my backyard, by the way. The sponges, which are often called the, uh, the, the parazoa, and the everybody else, which are the eumetazoa, which means true animals. Animals are often called metazoans, the group of animals. Um, animals in general, you may hear metazoa sometime. That means animals, okay? So eumetazoa consisting of cnidaria, which are radially symmetrical and branched off before the bilaterally symmetrical animals. And I'm checking for a tick, sorry. Okay, there are lots of ticks in my yard. And the balateria. All right, cool. So, um, here's the thing about phylogenies. And I'm just reminding you of this because your book reminds you of this. Phylogenies are hypotheses. And we're still, even in light of molecular data, we're still uh, resolving phylogenies. Okay? So, two really nice examples of this are the comb jellies, Tenophora. So, um, it's unclear whether they're diploblastic and have two germ layers or triploblastic with three germ layers. It's also we don't, not sure whether they have a complete gut or a blind gut. We're actually still learning about these animals. They're difficult to, um, they're difficult to describe, essentially. They're, I'm going to show you pictures of them in just a minute. They're very cool. But um, in terms of their development and physiology, there are still questions to be answered, and that in turn... Um, you know, has caused issues with, with phylogenetics um, in the past, okay? Um, now, uh, we still are trying to figure out things about their um, development, but we do have a better idea of their overall phylogeny simply because we have molecular data, right? Okay. And then uh, another puzzle, a group of animals that are fairly puzzling are the ketognatha, just so you know, heat refers to worms, or keto, if you hear a keet, that's a worm. Agnatha refers to jaws. So uh, these are the arrow worms, okay? And so it's still not clear whether they have a pseudocelum that is between that endoderm and mesodermally derived tissue, or a true coelom. And we're still not sure whether they're protostomes or deuterostomes. So there are still issues that are um, we're trying to resolve as scientists. So those are some things that may interest you as you move forward in your biological journey. All right, so let's look at all of the groups. Don't get too overwhelmed. We're going to actually go through protostomes. So the rest of the semester is protostomes and deuterostomes. Next week we start protostomes. Okay, so again, there are the parazoa, which are the sponges that do not have true tissues or symmetry. I'm moving now, just so you know, because the sun. Um, and then the eumetazoa, which is cnidaria, and everyone else. All the bilateria. My dog is eating grass. Okay. And within that, you he you have even finer groupings um, and clades. So, here, this is in your book, just so you know. So, uh, in your eumetazoa and clades, you have Acelomorpha, this is a group, all right, and then you have, um, and this is within the eumetazoa, so you've got sponges. Sponges are kind of just all out there by themselves, there we go, all out there by themselves, and then you have the eumetazoa, which consists of acelomorpha, and then you get into your protostomes and deuterostomes. So, within the protostomes, you have two big groups. Here, you have the spiralia, and we're going to talk about this in detail. So if you're like, well, what does all that mean? Why are you telling me all this? I'm just showing them to you right now, okay? We're going to talk about each one and what it means in the coming weeks. So don't be scared, okay? Or be scared if you want. I mean, you're allowed, your feelings are valid. Um, so spiralia here and ectozoa. These guys are the molting animals. That's what 
um, it's, it refers to the process of molting, ectasis. So these are ectasozoans and spiralians is how we refer to them. And even within there, you even have finer levels of detail that I'm not going to go into right now. But when we talk about protostomes, we will. Okay. And I will, and we'll talk about why they're all grouped the way they are. All right. Then you got, uh, is it out here? Let's see. Yeah. And deuterostomes. You know, I mean, what can you do? What can you do when you make your butt first? I don't know. You're just all in there. Um. So it's us, chordates, and the echinoderms, the spiny-skinned animals. And we are really very similar in a lot of ways as deuterostomes, which we will talk about when we cover specifically deuterostomes, um, even though obviously we're pretty different. I mean, I don't think I look that much like a sea urchin, but what do I know? Okay. So... I don't like the angle of this camera, but what can you do? Hmm. Let me fix my pigtails so I can tell you about... All right, here we go. Are you ready? This is my fo most favorite thing that we do, besides when we start walking through, like, chordate uh, classes and stuff. Uh, so, you see all this stuff down here? You see all that? You see that? We're gonna... I'm just going to introduce you to them. It's just like a grab bag of animals today. That's it. And that's the lecture. So... We'll see how long it takes. It's probably not going to take 50 full minutes. That's Siggy. Uh-oh. The neighbor dogs are out. She's ready to play. Siggy? Siggy, come say hi. Come here. Hi, Siggy. Oh, my goodness. She's the goodest. Yes, she's a chordate. <laughs> right? Kingdom, animalia, phylum, chordata, class, mammalia. Okay. Oh, she's... Okay, never mind. Okay. So let's do that. Let's just walk through it just to introduce you, because I think there are going to be some animals... Ziggy! Sorry. You've never seen before. World's weirdest. I totally encourage you to go down this rabbit hole. You see an animal and you're like, how? Look it up. All right. So, first, the parazoa. The periphera. The sponges. They're sponges. They lack symmetry, and they lack differentiated tissues, right? They lack tissues. Uh, you have about 26,000 um, species. Most of them are marine, but um, you actually do have a few hundred species of freshwater sponges. Fun fact. You also might remember from lab that larval sponges are free-swimming, and they have a superpower because their cells can differentiate and then de-differentiate, and then re-differentiate for various purposes. And you can think about the different kinds of cells that we talked about in lab, right? Like chonocytes. If these don't ring a bell, you should review your lab notes. Chonocytes, amoebocytes, right? Um, they are, they're structural tissues. Those spicules are part of sponge anatomy, okay? And remember parts of the sponge anatomy here, you've got the... Oh, where's my cursor? There it is. The osculum, right? And then here is the sponge seal, okay? And those chonocytes, they flagella a beat, and that draws water in. And water comes out through the osculum. Okay, so, sponges. Cnidaria. You remember these guys, too. So, these are, these, these guys have distinct tissue most of them are marine, but there are some freshwater cnidarians, such as our friend Hydra over here. Okay? They don't have any true organs, but they do have tissues. All right? Now, remember what we learned in lab. These are uh, predatory. They're carnivorous, and they capture their prey with... Sorry, there was a, a bird. With... Uh, they're nidocytes. Your book refers to them as nematocytes. Those are both the same kinds of cells, and that organelle within those cells, nematocysts, are those spring-loaded barbs oh, that inject. Let me do that again. Oh, inject um, toxins into their prey and paralyze them so that they can engulf them into their gastrovascular cavity, 
And these guys had a really cool key innovation because they were, um, they, sorry, I'm so distracted by nature. Um, they, uh, were some of the first animals to uh, exhibit extracellular digestion. So drawing prey into the gastrovascular cavity because inside your gut is outside your body and then it is taken into the cells. A lot of bird activity out here. Where's my dog? Piggy! 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 Hope my dog has not ran off. Okay. So... The various kinds of cnidarians. You've got your jellyfish. Piggy. I hear her jingle. All right. You've got your jellyfish here. So, um, hydra. So you've got hydrozoans. All right. Your syphozoans, the jellyfish. Anthozoans. That's your the nimin. Let me fix this. The nimin is the kid, you know what I mean? <laughs> the nimmerners. <laughs> the nimmerners. The nimmerners. Eminems. So you have those guys where Nemo lives. Um, all right. That are polyps, right? Corals. Sea fans. Those are all anthozoans. The cubozoans, which are the box jellies, which will kill you dead, right? And, okay. There's a less accepted um, class we don't talk about in the lab, the starozoa. Those are the star jellies. In lab, we talk about them as being part of the cytozoa. So, don't worry about that. I'm not going to, like, test you over the starozoa. But I just want to, to be introduced to it. Also, recall that we have two life stages here in the cnidarians. You have the polyp and you have the medusa. And some cnidarians are only polyp and some cnidarians are only medusa and some are both, right? And if you have both... Um, stages present in an organism, then they, uh, typically the medusa is who produces the gametes. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And you have the adorable tiny planula larva that is free swimming and goes off to find its way in the world before becoming a polyp and then a medusa. Okay. Let's move on. Some of these I'm just going to zoom through, though, because we got quite a few of these dudes. Um, all right. Tenophora. So, these, these are the comb jellies. They're called comb jellies because, I mean, look at it. It looks like a comb. Um, these actually are special cells that help, that are like super sticky. So they stick to prey. Okay, cool. So we're still learning about Tenophora, but these are the comb jellies. Okay. Macrocnathogzoa. These little animals, um, there's only one of them. <laughs> and it, let me see if I have it here. Oh, yes, good. And these guys are crazy because they have very distinct jaws and they're actually only recently discovered and they were found in springs, like freshwater springs in Greenland. So, birds everywhere. So, they're teeny weeny weeny, right? And they were found uh, 2000, around 2000, late 90s, early 2000s in Greenland. And um, this is, yes, Piggy, they were. And they have crazy, crazy jaws, okay? these This is actually just showing you um, this is actually just their jaws. All right. So, that's... Yes? Okay, I'm teaching. <laughs> Sorry, guys. See, I have to... I'm doing it all now. Um, all right. So, that's Macrocnathozoa. Now let's talk about Rufus, the little wheeled animals. Oh, sorry. These numbers are the number of species. Okay, so one in the whole phylum. Rotifers, so 2,500 species. Uh, and rotifers, rotifera, it refers to the, basically they're little wheeled animals. And if you, you should definitely look up a YouTube video of these little dudes. Because what happens is um, they look like, if you watch here or here, they use like these cilia that looks like there's a wheel in there um, to take in their, their food. Okay. And these guys are freshwater. I promise you, if you went out to Brian Lake, probably right now, um, don't, well, social distancing, but um, you could go out there and um, take a water sample, and I am almost certain you would find rotifers. They're very common. All right. 
Cycliophora. Oh, I always say this one wrong. Cycliophora. So three species of these guys. They're really cool. They were only recently discovered in like 1995. So that, and you're like, what? That is a long time ago. Shut up. Nuh-uh. I have very good memories in 1995. I watched a lot of Doug on Nickelodeon. Anyway, so was he on Nickelodeon? Rugrats was. Anyway, so these, um, they're so different from other animals that they were put into their own phylum. And guess where they live? Lobster mounts. <laughs> they are symbionts of lobsters and they're, they're commensalists so it means they gotta live on the lobster mouths but the lobsters don't really need them for anything they're not really a mutualist um so super cool so far we have three species that have been discovered but who knows there might be more these are still a recent development so they're itty tiny bitty so it's the cycliophora cycliophora lobster mouth dudes all right so now we're getting into organisms we're going to see in lab uh, the platyhelminthes. The platyhelminthes consist of 55,000 species of flatworms. I have two words for you. Penis fencing. I will post videos of flatworms doing their thing. So you have various groups of flatworms. You have the turbillaria, class turbillaria. Okay, you have the flukes, trivitota. And you have the cestota, which are the tapeworms. They're actually flatworms. They're not segmented worms. A fly just flew into my face. Okay, cool. And they are, oh, I should tell you, free living, parasitic. Okay. Brachiopods. Uh, I'm sad you won't get to see the brachiopods in the lab. We have them in jars about that big. They're pretty cute, but they can get big. Um, so this is 335 species of marine organisms, and they're often called lamp shells. And they live basically like the continental shelf, okay? And so they've got this little tail thing here that they stick down in the sand. And they look like clams, but the way that their shells are hinged is actually the opposite of... Oh, there's a spider on the computer. You're going to be important in a minute, little buddy. So um, these guys, they... Uh, sorry are hinged basically the opposite of the way that, that clams, um, the mollusks are, okay? But the way to remember brachiopods is they have this tail. Just remember that. And typically the shells are skinnier than a mollusk shell, okay? Bryozoa, 10,000 species of sea moss and sea mats. And they are not just, they're not moss. But we call them sea moss. So I'm very distracted by this jumping spider. Um, so, little animals. Bryozoa. Does that make, does that like ring a bell though? Bryo, right? Like moss, bryophyte. Well, bryozoa, this is a good way to remember that, is a sea moss. And it's an animal. That's where zoa comes from. Okay. Anelida. The segmented worms. So your segmented worms, you've got a lot of different species of these guys. They range from your typical little earthworm here. Okay to the, um, oh, it's marine. Uh, this is a ooh, polychaete. There you go. Clamworm. It's a clamworm. So clamworm. So these are marine annelids. Sorry, it took me a second. I was looking at it like, I know what this animal is. And um, also you have tube worms that live at the bottom of the ocean that are actually chemoautotrophic. They are technically annelids. And they feed on the hydrogen sulfide coming out of ocean vents. Amazing. And then uh, leeches. Leeches are actually segmented worms. I'm so sad that we won't, I won't get to show you leeches in the lab. I, I bring in leeches from some of my study sites. Um, so, but feel free to go find a leech. I guess. Actually, you can find any of these, right? You can dig up an earthworm. Just don't hurt it. I mean, try not to. Mollusks. Mollusks are very, very uh, successful, should we say. So mollusks are a, consist of 150,000 species, and you have various groups of mollusks. You've got gastropods, which are like your snails and your slugs. 
crash. This little slug is really hamming it up for the camera. If I do say so myself, that's a hammy slug. Okay, so you've got gastropoda. We're going to learn about these in lab too. I'm just introducing you. And the bivalves, okay, bivalvia, which are the clams and the mussels. And the cephalopods, which are the squid and octopi. And mollusks, um, gosh, these guys live, I should have told you. These guys live, um, well, here, terrestrial, marine, marine, freshwater, right? There are also um, freshwater, uh, well, these are freshwater. There are also freshwater and annelids that are more like earthworms that are just like hanging out, okay? They're like just worms that live in the water. Okay, so mollusks, these guys, you've got terrestrial um, snails, you've got sea snails, sea slugs, marine bivalves, freshwater bivalves, marine, um, mainly marine in the cephalopods, okay? And you'll notice that most of life really lives in the ocean, um, which makes sense because that's where we uh, know that life has evolved from marine ancestors. And so there's been a longer amount of time for life to evolve there. So you have a greater diversity there. Okay. Nematoda. So these are the round worms. These are free living and parasitic organisms. And um, you can't see them. But I can guarantee you in just this little piece of like soil that I picked up, there's going to be at least... Man, I wish I could put this under scope, um, but probably at least a few dozen, if not more, um, free-living soil nematodes. Nematodes are, oh my gosh, they can, in the soil, they can be good or, you know, they're just very important um, members of the soil community. Soil communities are full of organisms, and some of those are very small microscopic, ne microscopic nematodes. Um 61,000 species of nematodes, guys. Uh, there, We have cataloged, I, t I think I've told you, um, Cyanorhabditis elegans, which is this free-living soil nematode, is a powerhouse of molecular um, research. We've used C. elegans, we've mapped the genome, we know all about it. We know a lot about it, at least. Um, so it's been really, they've been really useful and good to humans. Um, they actually have some of the same... Uh, cellular processes that we do, even though you wouldn't expect that, right, If in a tiny nematode. But anyway, I see, I, I just I get, I start thinking about nematodes and I just get off the, on a tangent. Anyway, so Ascaris, which is the nematode that we are dissecting in lab this week, that is actually a parasitic nematode. This is a resected intestine. Oh no, don't leave me. I was just about to get to art. I was just about to get to arthropods, and then the little spider left. I'm really sad. Okay. Anyway. You probably know I was about to try to pick him up. Anyway, so here, Ascaris is a genus of parasitic soil, or not soil, parasitic nematode. Pinworms are in this group. Hookworms are in this group. A face only a mother could love. And then you also have um, filarial worms. And these guys, they can get, they can get all over you. Um, they could be in your blood or in your tissues, um, and can lead to all sorts of health problems. It can, it can actually kill you too. So, parasitic and free-living nematodes. All right, uh, Lorisifera. Lorisifera. Uh, these, there's only 35 species in this phylum, and their name is actually um, the, Lorisifera. Basically, means like armored. Um, animal or armored organism. Bear and pharaoh is like to bear, like to have armor. It has armor. Uh, these are like microscopic marine armadillos. Uh, that's how I like to refer to them. So, discovered not too terribly long ago, and they live in um, ocean sediments. Ocean sediment living animals, and they're tiny, obviously. Look at that. Did you know those existed before today? No, you didn't. Nope. All right. Uh, I have this is the same with the M&Ms. Nemertia. 2,400 species of these guys. These are ribbon worms. They're super cool. 
They are not analysts, just so you know who you think you're so mean. Oh, you think you're so mean. Just a Ziggy. Hi, Ziggy. Hi. Do you want to be in the video? No. Okay. For a minute. That's a treat. So, pay attention to this. What this ribbon worm has done is spit out its spidey web. So, what ribbon worms do is they're actually carnivorous. They are predators. I'm changing my because my back hurts. Okay. Right. They are um, carnivorous. And so what they do is they basically puke out a web. There's a lot of puking out of stuff that happens in the in the animal kingdom. Uh, so they puke out a web. And it's like, you know, Spider-Man goes, Lego. <laughs> to basically catch their prey. And so this is showing that um, that web deployed on someone's hand. Yeah. If he, if he pulls that off, he'll eat like a king, am I right? Okay. All right. You know him. You love him. The tardigrades. Phylum tardigrata. The water bears. So 1,300 species of water bears. That's a lot of species of water bears, right? They pretty you might look at this and go not so cute but they actually are pretty adorable their name actually comes from i think it means slow moving slow stepping um because they go actually the and they have their own theme music when they walk yes no that's a joke so they tend to live in like wet areas and moss so if you're ever looking for a tardigrade I had a friend in uh, my master's program who was also a lion alum who did a really cool project looking for tardigrades. Apparently, they're really hard to find. They had to go out like in the very early morning at like 5 a.m. and and light candles and pray to the tardigrade gods and all that. Okay. Ha! Ah! Ah! It's my favorite phylum. Well, I like chordates. No, I, no offense. No offense, Morty. Sorry, he's over there messing around. Um, so, Arthropoda. The, the jointed animals. Okay, so this and there, these are arguably the most successful. I wish you could see what my dog's doing. I mean, why not, right? Nothing is normal anymore. Why not show you my dog rolling in the grass during class? Okay. Arthropods. All right. I love them. Okay. Um, so, 1 million 200,000 species. So very, very successful. If you want to be successful, become an arthropod. All right. So here, various groups of arthropods. You have class in, in phylum Arthropoda, class Insecta, arguably the absolute most successful of all of the animal groups are the insects. You've got this crustacean here who looks like he's getting ready to drop a bomb A rap album. You have this arachnid, arachnoida. Hey, please don't dig up that. You know what? Find me a chordate, I guess. Uh, so, arachnids, it's like spiders and mites. Mites are also arachnids. Ticks, oh, I should have saved the tick I found on me. Let me find you a tick. You gotta be here somewhere. Oh, so now they don't want 
No ticks. Yay, I guess. Except now that it would actually be useful. Ain't that the way? Okay, anyway. So that is class, uh, the arachnids. We're going to learn about these in lab, so you don't, you know, you'll get lots of reminders. These are the millipedes. They're little herbivorous buddies. They won't hurt you, though they look a little intense because they have a jillion legs. Okay, and uh, that, um, those are the diplopo diplopods, diplopoda. Okay, and then here you have the carnivorous centipedes, chelopoda. Okay, they, uh, they eat your um, pests if you're in your house, but don't get too crazy with them because they, some of them can kind of like bite a little bit, but they wouldn't really hurt you. Okay, so arthropods, they're awesome. I can't wait to teach. So when we get in lab, when we get um, to it, you're actually going to be um, learning arthropods from me. I actually need to go and do the arthropod lab, don't I? Yes, I do. Okay. All right. And then uh, we have the Onychophora. Onychophora, um, 110 species. These are the velvet worms. You might say they're not annelids. You might be like, well, why aren't they with other worms? Well, they're not the same as them. That's why, Karen. So, on <laughs> Onychophora, sorry, I tickled myself. Um, these are carnivorous worms, and they are terrestrial, okay? They tend to live, uh, you, maybe you've seen a velvet worm. They live in rotted logs, they live in leaf litter, um, but, t well, I mean, I say you've probably seen them. They're, like, tropical, so, or, like, really warm climate. Okay, but velvet worms, they're carnivorous, um, terrestrial worms. All right. Key tech. Ooh. Oh. It was a sweet gum ball. So, key technatha. Um, key technatha is, that basically means, um, let's see. So, bristle jaws. Um, so, jaws here. Okay. Um, oh no, Keat. That's not worm. Keta, sorry, I think I told you earlier that Keta means worm. That's not right. Keta means, that is bristle jaws. I was like looking at them like, that's bristle jaws. No, Keta is bristles, like little tiny hairs and stuff. I'm sorry. Let me correct myself right now. Keta means bristles. Okay. So, um, Keta, Agnatha, these are the, duh. I'm glad that I was like, that's the common name of these guys, bristle jaws. Um, so, they're, these are like, Planktonic marine worms. So notice there's a lot of worms in the world. Apparently it pays not to have legs. Hey, I just got hit by an arthropod. <laughs> um, what do you need to know about these guys? 130 species of these guys. Um, and they tend to live like at the bottom. Like in algae or rocks um, on the continental shelf. Yeah. So those are the bristlejaw worms. <gasps> okay, here we go. Echinodermata, the spiny-skinned animals. This is 12,000 species of these guys, and they consist of, you've got your, you've got sea stars, sea urchins, sand dollars, or actually echinoderms, and sea cucumbers. And when we are in lab, we'll talk about how sea cucumbers, they also like to puke, they puke out their guts. So, they do, um something that I guess I think is pretty ingenious. Whenever a predator comes and tries to bother them, they try to distract or scare it, really scare it off by ejecting their digestive system. Which is like most sixth graders do whenever they see their crush, right? Um, so, yeah. Uh, it grows back, and they're okay till then. Um, but it, that is an interesting... Suki, would you please stop digging? I just... Oh, that's okay. So, sea cucumbers. Super cool. You can actually... We'll look. We'll watch videos of them puking, the, puking their guts literally up and out in a few weeks. Okay. Uh, I'm, let me think about this. Let me look at these guys for a minute. Um, so, yeah. All marine. So, all of them live in the ocean. If you're any kind of derm, you're in the ocean. Okay. Finally, Chordata. So we have arrived at our own animal phylum. I was checking the time. 
uh, 56,000 species, and we're going to go through chordata and even get it down into subphylum vertebrata and talk about mammals and birds and all that beautiful stuff. Um, so we'll talk about the fishes, reptilia, amphibians, aves, the avians, right, and the primates, um, which is in order, but um, mammals. So and that includes humans. So you're a member of phylum chordata. So your own address would be what? Eukarya is your domain, kingdom is animalia, and now we're down to your phylum, which is chordata. And I know we've talked about your own taxonomic um, address, I guess, but you know, keep track of that as we're going through this. So, all right, uh, that is all for today. And if you have any questions, you can post them to the biology discussion board on Schoology in our Schoology classroom in the materials page. And or you can email me, but it's really cool to do it on the discussion group so that everyone can see it. And or you can log on Friday at 8 a.m. for our optional extra credit, amazing, super cool Google Meet Bio 12 extravaganza and I will answer any questions you have and we can talk about it so um, this is the end of the material for your exam yay all right so let me know if you have questions um, the only thing you have to turn in this week so hopefully you're studying but do be sure that you finish your worksheet or it included the sponges and the cnidarians. I thought that would be good. So, you know, some review. All of the worksheets from all the labs are up, but um, so it can be helpful to do those. And but the only one due this week is for the sponges and um, cnidarians. Also has and the flatworms and nematodes. They're all together. It's all the worms. It's not really all the worms, but it's worms and jellyfish and their friends and sponges. Okay. All right. I will see you on the internet. Ah. Bye.